Hi everyone, my name is Katie Wiskar and I'm back from Western Sano and UBC IM POCUS and today we're going to be talking about solid organ Doppler assessment of venous congestion. Once again, many thanks to Dr. Rob Arnfield for his help with this project. So today we're going to talk about a fairly novel topic that's gaining a lot of interest in the POCUS world. And this is an advanced topic for the real ultrasound nerds out there and presumes a good understanding of spectral Doppler. So if you need a refresher, I'd highly suggest checking out the screencast that's cross-posted to the UBC IM POCUS and Western Zono sites. So we spend a lot of time in POCUS and in medicine in general obsessing about fluids. And we talk about fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance and volume status, and we obsess over what kind of salt water to give people. And we're really, generally speaking, moving towards an era of fluid restrictive strategies as we recognize the increasing harms of excessive fluid administration. So we've long recognized the respiratory consequences of excessive fluids, but we're really now recognizing that every organ in the body can be negatively impacted by too much fluid. So you can get hepatic congestion, gut edema and malabsorption, uh, acute kidney injury and renal congestion, delirium and cerebral edema, poor wound healing, the list really goes on. Now, as easy as it is to condemn excessive fluids, determining just how much fluid is too much can be very challenging. And over the years, we've had a variety of techniques to help us determine this elusive volume status, none of which are perfect. First, we started at neck veins and pretended to see X and Y descents in the JVP. Then we turned to our monitors and chased CVP values. Then along came POCUS and the IVC was touted as the solution to all of our problems, which of course it wasn't. And now we recognize the importance of looking at several organs with our ultrasound, including the heart, the lungs for beelines, as well as the IVC. But what if we could do even better? So today we'll be focusing on four vessels, although some others have been described. The evaluation of the hepatic vein, the portal vein, the renal artery, and the renal parenchymal vein. So before we dive into these individual waveforms in detail, let's quickly review the general pathology of what happens to arterial and venous flow in states of increasing congestion. In arteries, venous congestion results in increased arterial resistance and accelerated systolic flow with blunted diastolic flow, that is, a greater gap between the flow during these two states. In veins, we see blunting of flow, pulsatility, and often eventual reversal of flow in a pattern that depends on the vein itself, its normal direction of flow, and its relationship to the heart. So we'll start things off by exploring the hepatic vein. So the hepatic vein waveform is different from a traditional monophasic low-velocity venous waveform given its proximity to the heart. A normal hepatic vein waveform is triphasic, although it actually has four components, and we see it here as it relates to the familiar CVP waveform. The primary components are the S and the D wave, which correspond to systole and diastole, respectively. Here, blood is flowing towards the heart, or away from our ultrasound probe. The A and the V waves denote blood flowing up the hepatic vein towards the probe and represent atrial contraction and atrial overfilling, respectively. Under normal physiologic circumstances, the S wave is greater than the D wave. When examining this waveform, what we're interested in is the relationship between the S and the D waves, which changes in states of venous congestion, and a qualitative analysis of the waveform morphology. The hepatic vein is typically the easiest of the four vessels to identify and is usually readily seen when scanning the IVC from a sub-xiphoid view. This scan can be performed with either the phased ray or the curvilinear probe. Because of the relatively high blood velocities present in the hepatic vein, I found that performing it as an extension of my cardiac study with a phased ray probe in cardiac mode is effective and also allows for the option of adding ECG gating depending on your machine. First we use color Doppler to identify a strong signal, as seen here, and then we'll use pulse wave Doppler to generate a spectral waveform. So here we have an example of our hepatic vein waveform. We see clearly defined S and D waves, with the S wave being larger than the D wave, which is normal. The A and the V waves are harder to define here, which is not unusual. In my experience with these scans, it's quite common to have some noise above or below the baseline, and one of the challenges of this scan is to become confident about which waveforms represent actual physiologic flow and which are just noise. So here we have a schematic demonstrating the progression of the hepatic vein tracing in states of increasing venous congestion. First, we get increased magnitude of the D wave so that it becomes larger than the S wave. The S wave then decreases in magnitude and may eventually become reversed, demonstrating flow away from the heart during ventricular systole. Note that this last pattern is only seen if at least some degree of tricuspid regurgitation is present to account for the reversal of flow during systole. TR, of course, may coexist in patients with venous congestion, and right heart failure in particular, but it is one of the potential confounders that we'll discuss a bit later. 
So here we have an example of a hepatic vein waveform in a patient with venous congestion, right heart failure, and severe tricuspid regurgitation. We know that there is TR because we are actually seeing reversal of the direction of the S wave, shown here. So just to go through a few more examples, as it can take some practice to get used to distinguishing the S wave from the D wave, here again is a normal waveform with the S wave greater in magnitude than the D wave. We're helped by ECG leads here to distinguish our two waveforms, and this is an excellent tool to use if you have it at your disposal, particularly as you're learning how to generate and interpret these tracings. Here we don't have ECG leads, but we note that the waveforms are paired. Therefore, we can interpret this wave as the S wave, while the second smaller wave is the D wave. This tracing is therefore normal. This tracing is a bit more challenging to interpret, particularly due to tachycardia. However, here and here, we can particularly appreciate the paired nature of the waveforms. Therefore, we can see that the D wave is actually greater than the S wave, consistent with venous congestion. Next, we'll move on to assess the portal vein. This can be interrogated from the mid to posterior axillary line in a coronal plane, as demonstrated in the schematic. It can also be found by scanning the anterior abdomen at the right costal margin, as you would to identify the gallbladder, and then following the gallbladder down to its neck to identify the portal triad. I'd advise performing this and the rest of the scans discussed here with a curvilinear probe on the abdominal preset, as this allows for improved 2D resolution of the solid organs, and the Doppler gating is optimized for lower blood velocities. So here we have the portal vein, first identified using color Doppler, and once again we're going to interrogate it with pulsed wave Doppler to generate a spectral waveform tracing. So here we have a normal portal vein tracing. This is a typical venous waveform, similar to what you'd see in most veins in the body under normal physiologic conditions, demonstrating continuous low-velocity flow throughout the cardiac cycle. You'll note that this waveform is not seen for part of the screen capture, which is a product of translation of the portal vein during respiration, causing it to slide out of the picture. Navigating this issue can be a significant challenge in solid organ Doppler, which we'll address a bit later. So here we have the progression of waveform morphologies that occur as you progress down the road of venous congestion. Increased venous pressures result in diminished and eventually retrograde blood flow during diastole, creating a pulsatile waveform. So we can assess the portal vein waveform qualitatively, as demonstrated here, and we can also measure what is called a pulsatility fraction, or PF. PF is defined as the maximal blood velocity minus the minimum blood velocity, all divided by the maximal velocity. A PF of more than 0.5 is abnormal and consistent with venous congestion. Two things to note here. First, the formula for calculating PF is essentially the same as that for calculating a resistive index in arteries, which is a much more common application. Hence, most machines will spit out an RI value when you're performing these measurements, as we'll see later. Secondly, note that the PF is not to be confused with the pulsatility index, as is used in other applications, which is a slightly different formula, dividing the difference between maximal and minimal velocities over the mean instead of the maximal velocity. So here we have an example of an abnormal portal vein waveform. We can see that there's clearly an undulating or pulsatile characteristic to this tracing. So this is a normal portal vein waveform, but demonstrates the calculation of the PF. Many machines will automatically spit this out if you measure maximal and minimal velocities. Here, PF is 0.39, reported as an RI, as mentioned earlier, which is within the normal range. So moving on to talk about the renal vessels. First up, the renal artery. So again, we'll identify the kidneys as you typically would in an abdominal scan using the curvilinear probe and the abdominal preset. We'll then make use of color Doppler to identify blood vessels, which is particularly important because of the diminutive size of the renal vessels in comparison to the hepatic and portal veins. Here we have very nice color flow. Doppler tracings will obviously be challenging to acquire in suboptimal images with little to no color flow. Now isolating the renal artery versus the vein can be challenging. The most practical strategy here is to place your PW gate over an area of strong color signal and then observe the morphology of the resultant tracing. You can then take a second tracing after moving the PW gate just slightly laterally as the renal vessels travel in pairs, or in some cases, you may actually catch both arterial and venous waveforms in a single shot with the artery above the baseline and the vein below the baseline. Here we have a spectral waveform tracing of a renal artery. You'll note the typical morphologic appearance that is characteristic of arterial Doppler and will be familiar from interrogation of other peripheral arteries. Here we have higher velocity flow in systole with low velocity flow throughout diastole. So as you can see here, we can calculate the renal resistive index, or RRI, from this waveform. Though the terminology is different, this is essentially the same calculation that we performed with the portal vein above. Peak systolic velocity minus end diastolic velocity divided by peak systolic velocity.
The renal arteries are normally low resistance vessels, so a normal RRI is 0.55 to 0.7. This schematic again represents the progression of the renal artery waveform as you move from normal physiology to increasing states of venous congestion. The resistive index will increase above the normal cutoff of 0.7 and will approach 1 as you get an absence of diastolic flow in severe cases. Here's an example of an abnormal renal artery waveform where we can clearly see diminished flow in diastole. The calculated RRI is 0.79, which is abnormal. And one more abnormal renal artery waveform, this time with an RRI of 0.82. Lastly, we'll talk about the analysis of the renal parenchymal vein waveform. This is also known as the interrogation of intrarenal venous flow, or IRVF. This is interrogated in the same manner as the renal artery, using color Doppler to identify renal vessels, then dropping a PW gate just lateral to an identified renal artery. Sometimes you can catch the intrarenal artery and vein on the same tracing, with arterial flow located above the baseline and venous flow below the baseline. So this is a normal renal parenchymal vein waveform, which is continuous, as with a portal vein waveform, and located below the baseline, as blood is flowing away from the transducer. Here, you can also see a faint arterial waveform from a nearby artery above the baseline. Of the four vessels discussed today, this is probably the hardest waveform to obtain, owing to the small size of the renal vessels and often considerable movement of the kidney with respiration. It's particularly challenging in patients with high BMI or other causes for a suboptimal 2D image. The spectrum of pathology here is similar to that in the portal vein. Here we're interested in the qualitative morphology of the waveform rather than a quantitative analysis. With increasing venous congestion, we move from a continuous waveform to a pulsatile waveform and eventually to a biphasic and then monophasic pattern in severe cases. So here we have an example of severe pathology with monophasic diastole-only flow in the renal parenchymal vein. So now that we've described the waveforms, their acquisition, and their interpretation across the spectrum of venous congestion, it's important to highlight that there are other things that can also cause the abnormalities that we've discussed, and in their presence we must interpret the waveform changes as a marker of venous congestion with some caution. There are several intra-abdominal factors that can cause Doppler waveform abnormalities, including increased intra-abdominal pressure, primary renal or liver pathology, which will affect the renal or hepatic and portal vessel waveforms, respectively, and vascular pathology, such as hepatic or portal vein thrombosis or renal artery stenosis. Other factors to be wary of include tricuspid regurgitation, constrictive pericarditis, and hyperdynamic states. It's also worth noting that portal vein pulsatility has been described in normal patients with a low BMI in the absence of any other pathology. Finally, given that this is a fairly new field of study, there are also a few factors whose effect on these waveforms has yet to be clearly defined, including positive pressure ventilation versus spontaneously breathing patients, changes in respiratory effort, and arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, to name a few. So putting it all together. So this is a really great table from an editorial in Jack, Heart Failure, which puts all the pieces together. You'll recognize the graphics as the ones we've used throughout the presentation to demonstrate the spectrum of pathology in these various waveforms. As you can probably gather by the caveats we've just discussed, these studies really must be interpreted in conjunction with each other and with the rest of the clinical picture. A single abnormal waveform is often difficult to interpret. However, several abnormal tracings, which all suggest venous congestion, paint a much stronger picture. So speaking of interpreting these studies as a unit, the VEXA score, or Venous Excess Ultrasound Score, has been proposed by Thinking Critical Care's Philippe Rolla and others as a way to quantify the degree of abnormality evident on solid organ Doppler assessment. More on this can be found in the chapter on venous congestion in Rolla's book, Bedside Ultrasound, a Primer for Clinical Integration. It's worth highlighting something here. A plethoric IVC is the starting point for going further and performing solid organ Doppler for venous congestion. A non-plethoric IVC in the absence of confounding factors strongly suggests that there is no significant venous congestion. At this point, studies are currently underway to validate the VEXA score, so stay tuned for more on this. Without getting too lost in the weeds here, it's important to note that the evidence base for using these studies as markers of venous congestion is still quite young. Most of the work so far has been done in heart failure patients, and importantly, there are no studies to date examining the effects of intervening based on solid organ Doppler signs of venous congestion, and whether the addition of these studies to typical clinical and ultrasound evaluation improves clinical outcomes. So with all those caveats and contextual factors, how can we actually use this clinically? I think where these studies can be useful is as an additional data point supporting venous congestion and perhaps an earlier sign than the traditional B-lines or right heart dysfunction.
Specific patient populations where this may be useful include patients with known heart failure to titrate diuretics, septic patients who are at risk of being over-resuscitated with intravenous fluids, and an acute kidney injury to help support a cardiorenal diagnosis. So a few general tips and tricks, because these scans can be difficult to generate and interpret. So the biggest problem is often translation of the vessels with respiration, particularly with the renal vessels. So in cooperative patients, breath holding can be really useful. And note that you should then take your image at end expiration. Uh, for the hepatic vein, as mentioned before, ECG gating can be really helpful to help you distinguish the S and the D wave, particularly in tachycardic patients. Uh, and finally, as with many things, it's really helpful to scan a lot of normals so that when abnormal waveforms do present themselves, you're better able to recognize them. So finally, just to highlight some general caveats, really important to be aware of the pitfalls and other things that can affect your waveforms, as we've talked about. Uh, remember to integrate these studies with your other POCA studies, so your IVC in particular, uh, your heart and your lung exams. And always remember to be a clinician first and integrate your POCUS findings with the entire clinical context. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, let me know if you have any thoughts, comments, questions. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks and happy scanning.